bit test is in four part, part one, part two, part three, and part four. Now look at part one. Part one. You will hear a conversation between a police officer and a woman who witnessed an accident. First, you have some time to look at questions one to four. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions one to four. Hello, madam. I understand you witnessed the accident. Have you got a few minutes to tell me what you saw? Yes, no problem. I don't have to be back at work for a while, so I'm pleased to help. Did you actually see what's happened? Yes. I was standing over there, near the bus stop. I was on my way to get something for lunch and just happened to be looking at a shop across the road. That's when I saw the red car come out from the junction over there. You don't happen to know what time it occurred, do you? Well, I left work for my lunch break at one, and it's only about ten minutes walk away. But the office, I mean. So it might have been about ten past one. Although I did pop into the shop for something, so it was probably closer to one fifteen. So it pulled out of Monk's Road, that's the road over there, straight on to High Street. That's right, yes. Did you get a view of who was in the car? There were three of them. Two in the front, the driver of course, someone in the passenger seat and there was someone in the back. They were quite young. I doubt if they were much older than 20. Anyway, they came speeding out of the side road over there and hit that lady's bicycle. The driver didn't bother to stop to find out if she was OK. He just drove off along the main road towards the town centre. A... Uh, is the woman OK? She should be fine. She banged her head when she came off the bike, so we've called for an ambulance. They always like to check you out in case you have concussion. But no, she seems fine. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 5 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 5 to 10. The bike doesn't look too good, though. I don't think she'll be using that again. I suppose she was very lucky, really. If they'd hit her instead of the front wheel, she could have been seriously injured. It looked like they were just in a hurry and didn't want to stop at the junction. I know the traffic lights aren't working there, so perhaps they thought they could just pull out. Could you give me a description of the car? Do you know the make and model? Well, I'm not very good with cars, but I'm pretty sure it was the same model as my husband's car, a Ford Fiesta. It was red, like I said, and quite old, and the door on the driver's side was damaged. It looked like it had been in another accident some time ago. I don't suppose you had a chance to take down the registration number, did you? I did, actually. Let me see. Um, why for... 8 B Y W. Will that help you trace them? That's really helpful. It depends. It might be a stolen car, but at least we'll be able to trace the owner. If it wasn't stolen, then yes, we'll be able to find out the name of the driver. Now, would you mind giving me your contact details, just in case we need to get in touch about anything? Of course. What's your name? Mrs. Stansfield. Rita Stansfield. That's S-T-A-N-S-F-I-E-L-D. And your address, Mrs Stansfield? 19 Althorpe Road, Bradford. That's A-L-T-H-O-R-P-E. Have you got a telephone number we can get you on? Yes, it's 0232 
five double six seven double eight. And do you have a mobile number? Yes. O seven eight three four double eight nine double seven two. That's great, Mrs. Stansfield. As I said, we may get in touch if we need any further information, but probably what you've told me is enough. Thanks for your time. No problem. I'm glad to have been of help. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part two. Part two. You will hear a presenter on a radio phone-in show. The presenter is talking to a woman who was bitten by a poisonous spider. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 15. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 15. Today, we're continuing our traveller's tales. On the line, we have Amanda Toddington, who had quite a nasty experience in Australia last year. Isn't that right, Amanda? Yes. My husband and I were on holiday, and we were staying at a friend's house on the coast near Brisbane. It was towards the end of the holiday, and I was about to go into the garden and enjoy my breakfast. I walked out into the kitchen, slid my left foot into my shoe and felt a tiny sting. It was pretty painless, but I shook the shoe off my foot and saw this tiny spider running out as the shoe hit the wall. Anyway, not being an expert, I presumed the worst, that I'd been bitten by something that was going to kill me and I completely lost control. I don't think I've ever screamed so much in all my life. We'd been told beforehand to always check our shoes before putting them on, as it's a common way to get bitten. So I suppose it was my own fault, really. So what was it that had bitten you? Tony, that's our Australian friend, he immediately asked me if I knew what had bitten me, and I pointed to the corner of the room where I'd last seen the spider. He picked up a jar and found the creature in the corner where the shoe had hit the floor. It's a red back, he said, and he gently placed the jar over the spider. The funny thing was, we'd been talking about some of the creatures we needed to be careful of a few days previously, and as he said the name Redback, the conversation came flooding back to me, in particular the fact that the bite can be extremely painful. I've found out since that the Redback is from the same family as the Black Widow Spider, and it's the female that does the damage, which it turned out was what I'd been bitten by. You must have been absolutely petrified. You can say that again. I remember feeling quite confused. I wasn't in a great deal of pain to begin with, and yet I could see from our friends' faces that they were concerned. Tony explained that the venom, or poison, of the bite spreads quite slowly, so the pain doesn't feel too bad at first. Gwen, Tony's wife, brought an ice pack, and Tony held it against the bite to make it less painful. Apparently, you're not supposed to put a bandage on the area, as this can make it hurt even more. Uh, Tony tried to put my mind at rest by explaining that this was quite a common bite, that the hospital would have an anti-venom and that everything would be OK. But I was beginning to panic. We were flying back to the UK the next day, and I really didn't know what to do. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 16 to 20.
Now listen and answer questions 16 to 20. So what did you do? Well, Tony phoned the doctor, who told him to check my symptoms for the next hour or two. As time went on, the pain became very intense, from my foot right up to my knee. My husband was on the internet and was reading out the possible symptoms. I wasn't feeling sick, and I hadn't yet developed a fever, but I had a terrible headache, and my foot was beginning to swell up. At this point, Tony decided to take me to the local hospital to be on the safe side. I really didn't want to go, as I had visions of being kept in for days and all our plans being spoilt. But Tony and my husband insisted. When we got to the hospital, I was relieved to see how casual everyone was when Tony explained I'd been bitten by a red-back spider. They told me to take a seat and got on with their work. And did you receive any treatment? By the time I got to see a doctor, the pain was very intense indeed, and I was getting quite upset. The doctor decided to give me a dose of an antivenom, which he assured me would eventually deal with the problem. Unfortunately, he also explained that it wouldn't have an immediate effect and the symptoms might last for several days. But the story has a happy ending. My husband managed to book us onto another plane one week later. And even better news was that the symptoms of the bite finally cleared up after about 24 hours. Within a couple of days, I was back to normal again. So thanks to the spider, we managed to extend our holiday by a week. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part three. Part three. You will hear a conversation between a university tutor and a student about a jobs fair. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 23. Now listen and answer questions 21 to 23. OK, Fergus, so we've looked at your assignment, which was OK. Now, before you go, you know about the jobs fair that's coming up, don't you? Yes, it's the week after next, isn't it? The whole week, is that right? That's right. Monday through to Friday. I'd suggest making sure you get along there on Tuesday and Wednesday. Engineering companies tend to be more prominent then, rather than on Monday or the end of the week. Um, yes, I've got the programme for this year, and it looks like those days will be best for me. I'm only in my first year, so I'm not expecting too much from the day. But I've heard you can pick up some valuable ideas for career paths. Well, you've still got a few years here, I know, but it's never too soon to make a good impression on potential employers. You've got the programme, so do some research. Have a look at company websites so you've got the basis for a good conversation with the people on the stands. Before you hear more of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 24 Yes, I was looking at one the other day. The boss was being interviewed about their staff development programme 
And there are one or two other firms I'm also interested in.、Mm, that's good. You've made a start already. Remember to think about what you're going to ask people before you turn up. Not how much you're likely to earn, of course. You only discuss salaries at job interviews. No, questions about the skills you need for the job, the kind of personal qualities employers are looking for, that kind of thing. Yes, I see what you mean. It's best to go prepared and make the most of the opportunities.、Mm. And I'm sure you don't need telling that it's a good idea to dress correctly for the event. You need to give off a professional air. Well, I won't be buying anything special for the occasion, that's for sure. I've got a suit and tie at my parents, but I don't have time to collect it. I'll make an effort, though. A nice pair of trousers and a jacket, nothing too formal. I'm sure you'll look the part.、Uh, by the way, you'll often find companies have more than one representative. Maybe someone from marketing handing out free gifts, someone who'll explain the interview process, an ex student who now works for them, that kind of thing. Try and direct your questions towards the best person. Yes, that's a good idea. I'd certainly be keen to talk to any ex students that are around. I'm sure you'll find the whole thing really useful. It's important to go to these events, and we always get great feedback from students who've attended. As long as you go with the right expectations, it's unlikely you'll come away with the promise of a job, of course. It's more about discovering what companies are looking for in potential employees. Yes, plus, they're a great opportunity to practice things like networking, meeting new people. Talking about yourself and what you do. Do you know what I mean? Definitely, yes. There will be several high profile companies in the engineering sector, and you'll have the chance to get to know some useful people. If they give you their card or contact information, make sure you keep it safe. It's a sign they like you and want to keep in touch. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part four. Part four. You are going to hear a lecturer giving a talk on a type of fundraising for business called crowdfunding. First, you have some time to look at questions thirty-one to forty. Now listen carefully and answer questions thirty-one to forty. Good morning, everyone. Today we're continuing our look at funding opportunities for small startup businesses. The emergence of social media has given companies the ability to connect with fans and potential customers directly. On the back of the growth in social media. A model of raising finance has emerged, known as crowdfunding. This revolutionary way of raising finance began with micro lending in the 90s. More recently, an equity-based model has emerged that allows people to invest directly in a new company. We're going to examine this in more detail later, but let's turn first to a third model, which I'll term a fan-based model. With this model of crowdfunding. Individuals are encouraged to give an amount of money to support the launch of a project or initiative 
without the promise of any financial return. Instead, there's a reward for donating. This contrasts with the micro-lending model, which would require a return on investment, and the equity-based scheme, which may offer shares. Crowdfunding portals or websites allow the business concerned to present the initiative along with the financial target required. There's a fixed time limit for fundraising, and if the target amount is reached, all donations are paid to the company or individual. Whether it's an author planning to write a new book, an independent film company looking to make a new film, or a technology company with an idea for an app, the person or company needing funding would turn to its fan base for support. This is managed through one of the many crowdfunding online portals that have emerged. Of course, a fan or supporter of a particular initiative is likely to give money anyway. But donation-based crowdfunding will often make donating even more attractive by offering a rewards-based incentive scheme. Let's take a film company, for example, that needs funding for a new film. For a small, set donation, the donor might be offered a free ticket to the premiere or a DVD of the film. A larger set donation might be rewarded by the chance to attend a launch event when the film goes live. Those people who make bigger donations could even be offered the chance to meet the cast of the film, whilst the highest level donation could see the person's name mentioned in the film credits. For companies that already have a significant fan base, crowdfunding offers a fantastic opportunity to raise money quickly from a large number of people, each of whom donates just a small amount of money. Compare this to the time and effort that would be needed to sell your idea to investors or your bank manager, particularly in an age when raising finance can be difficult. The company may also have links with partner companies or organisations that run fundraising events. In this case, you can significantly increase participation by working with these organisations to promote your crowdfunding project. Another significant advantage is that you can reach out to your fan base for feedback on the project while it's being developed, thus making the final product more appealing. Crowdfunding enables you to raise awareness of the product at an early stage, thus increasing the potential for sales. With so many people behind you, it can also act as a great incentive to get the best possible product out on time and on budget. However, there are disadvantages to bear in mind. The model can be described as all or nothing. If you don't reach the monetary target required in the agreed time, all promises of donations are cancelled and no money is paid, leaving you back at square one. Should this happen, or still worse, you receive the funding but are unable to come up with the product, not only will your fans end up disappointed, but the portal will record the fact that you failed to reach your target or that the initiative failed. Fulfilling all the pledges that you've made to people can also be very time-consuming. For example, remembering to send out copies of books or free cinema tickets can sometimes be forgotten in the excitement and frenzy of launching your product. People sometimes forget to factor in the cost of rewards when calculating profit margins. But these can be significant. And finally, if you have a small fan base, for example, you're a new company or have a small social media footprint, raising awareness of your initiative will be challenging. These drawbacks aside, donation-based crowdfunding is a wonderful opportunity for individuals or small startups to raise funds for that exciting new project whilst reaching out and connecting to the people who are most likely to support and promote your work for you. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.